Um, today, we'll be speaking about the role of the creative economy in cultivating inclusive societies. We have a stellar panel for you here today, three in person, in body, uh, as Paul said, and one joining us from the UK. Uh, today's discussion will address the factors required to ensure an environment in which creativity flourishes, act to the creative economy, inclusivity. We'll talk about the potential to unlock value chain models. And I think we have a very fair representation of cities from across the world. Los Angeles is represented, the UK is represented, Abu Dhabi is represented, and we're all here in Dubai, and we have uh, an another 45 minutes to talk about this. So I think I'll begin with, uh, with a general uh, question. Do we need to introduce you again? So it would probably save us a few minutes if I don't do that. Maybe before I do that, I'd like to set some context first about uh, the role of Dubai and Dubai's ambition since we are here uh, in this magnificent city. Uh, Dubai has its own uh, creative economy ambitions. By 2025, Dubai has uh, aims to transform its creative economy and in fact double the contribution of the creative industries to the GDP from 2.5% to 5%. This is by 20. 25, Dubai seeks to create uh, 15,000 jobs in that sector, and uh, they want to do this in the next four years, and I believe that we are hopefully to uh, be, be able to beat that. Um, so my first, my first question is, we hear all these all the cities wanting to uh, instill a, a creative industry and strengthen it. We know the, how it succeeded in New York, in London, Singapore, and Berlin recently. But whose responsibility is it? Who's, is it, is it the, the government sector? Is it the business sector? Is it, is it the entrepreneurs? Are they the young creatives? Maybe we begin with you, Laura, <laughs> on my immediate left. Go ahead. Well, in Los Angeles, it's everyone's responsibility. Okay. But as someone who worked for Los Angeles County, overseeing a very large area with 10 million people, I would say first and foremost, it's the government. The government really has to plan and have the vision for the future, and inclusivity needs to be part of that vision, just like the new plan for super uh, train connection throughout the Emirates. Uh, we have to think about connecting people in other kinds of ways, not just in transportation ways. Oh, I love that you're also abreast of the developments in the UAE. This plan was just launched uh, or announced a couple of days ago. Do you folks agree that it's the government? Do you think it's a mixture? Hands up, hands up, whoever thinks it's the government here. Do you, hands up, whoever thinks it's a mixture of several. Mixture of several, okay, great, wonderful. So what do you think, Paul? Uh, well, from my experience, um, I think that's partly true. Uh, but I think you need uh, a very particular kind of leadership. Uh, and, 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 and you need basically uh, leaders, or even sometimes a leader, who have a kind of a, a feel, a deep understanding, and a feel and a passion for the cultural and creative sector, but who know how to play the government game, who know how to play mm. the business game, who know how to sort of span boundaries. And if you look at uh, the cities in my network, we've got 40 major cities in the World Cities Culture Forum. I think in almost every single city, you'll find uh, a leader or a group of people. Most of them have come from a cultural and creative background. Mm -hmm. Some of them are actually artists mm -hmm. originally, yeah? Uh, and, and they've basically become politicians. Uh, and they've become like kind of creative politicians uh, who kind of take it uh, to the system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think without that kind of uh, really uh, really sort of um, felt uh, approach and that, that kind of deep leadership that's connected to yeah. the sectors, um, I think it's much harder to get real long-term sustainable development. If yeah. you just depend on government alone and top-down yeah. planning, I, I, think, I think it becomes a, a much more difficult, more, less sustainable approach. I think I agree with you, Paul. Here in the UAE, we've been blessed with, uh, you know, oil and gas and sun, but we've also been blessed with great leaders. So not just leaders in uh, the general public, but also the government, uh, choosing people like uh, Noor Al-Kabi as Minister of Culture, somebody who's really pushing forward the, uh, the, the cultural agenda. Pradeep, you're familiar with this leadership, the important role of leadership. You work with the uh, uh, Sheikh Salama Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Do you agree that it's the responsibility of the government and leadership? What about I, everybody else? I think I'm, I would just want to get a bit more nuanced on what we mean by responsibility, because I, I, I see sort of, sort of you know, the role of government in some ways is, is, is a parent model. And so are they responsible for creating content? 
No. Are they responsible mm. for creating the conditions? Yes. Mm. So I think when we talk about responsibility, I think we've got to be quite specific about what are they responsible for because the government can't lead creativity, but they can create the conditions for creativity. So when you ask the question, who is responsible for creativity? Mm. It's you. It's me. It's Layla. It's Dana. It's all of us in that, but we all are play Are these real people, Layla and Dana? They are actually there. They're real they're, people. They're, okay. They are. Okay. Shout out for them for um, setting the conditions for the golden line at the Venice Biennale. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, who, who does it come down to? Our responsibility changes. It changes from the top level down. So yes, regulatory changes, we can't change that. The government can change that. Creating content, we can change that. So I think responsibility, I think we've got to be a lot more nuanced. So I mean, I think Laura's answer at the beginning, we are all responsible, but at different roles yeah. in the organization. So I mean, I, I do think, I personally think this is a personal agenda for me. I think it's a personal agenda for a lot of people here that we want to change it. So what can we change in those bits? And then what can we lobby? Because no regulations, LA, Singapore here, actually encourage creativity to a certain degree. So I mean, I, I think for me, if we take the metaphor of parenting, a parent telling you to go be creative in your room is rarely going to work. Uh, but a parent yeah. creating conditions yeah. could work. I think that's a great point that the government can set the stage, build the infrastructure, but the creativity also yeah. needs to emanate from, the, uh, from, yeah. every, from every person around yeah. us and not just people who are in leadership positions. Caroline Norbury, who's joining us from the UK, welcome. We wish you were with us, but you are with us here and we'll take full advantage of that. You are the founding chief executive of Creative Industries Federation in the UK. Uh, it's a national organization to support the creative industries. Can you tell us how you go about supporting the creative industry of the UK? And we know that London, and not just London, but even other towns and cities in the UK have a thriving creative industry scene. Can you tell us your role and how this could be replicated maybe in other cities around the world? Absolutely. Um, can I just correct you, though? Sorry. I'm not the founding chief executive of the Creative Industries Federation. Um, I'm the founding chief executive of an organization called Creative England. Oh, okay. um, and I took over running the Creative Industries Federation. Okay. And now we have established Creative UK. Sorry, so just, just, just for, just for accuracy there. Um, and, um, and I suppose the, 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 uh, I'll absolutely talk to you a little bit about, um, about the motivation behind that. But can I just sort of come in on the, the conversation you've just been having, really, which is that I think one of the um, areas that we missed out just talking about responsibility is the public and mm -hmm. um, civil society. And, um, and in my day-to-day -day work and, and the work that we do at Creative UK, um, I think about the, that responsibility as a compact between those three essential players, between the public and society, um, between government, but also industry and business. And, and each day I put myself into each of those three taxonomies and look through the lens of their priorities regularly. Um, and I think it's really difficult to bring about any change if you don't look at that wider picture. Um, and if you don't understand the perspectives of all of those different players. Um, and ultimately, um, uh, as we've just heard, you know, change actually starts with ourselves. And responsibility really sort of start, starts, with our, starts with ourselves first. Um, so the, the, the two companies that I've brought together have, um, have uh, one sort of core focus and have always had one core focus, which is about change making. Um, but they have very, they have different, but, 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 but ultimately complementary expertise. So one focuses very much on change making through campaigning and policy change. And the other focused, uh, which is a business I founded, on change making by supporting talented people to build their careers and to build their businesses. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, I think I'm slightly unusual as somebody who heads up a creative development agency in that I have come from a very practical industrial background rather than a policy background. And, um, uh, and I think that what I realized is that um, uh, it, in, in order to make the change, you have to work with business and industry at all levels and not just with leaders. So mm -hmm. it's very much about trying to sort of reach out as wide as possible in order to build those ecosystems. And, and, and if you do this, you can ensure that any campaigning and the policy making that you're involved with is far more credible and actually mm -hmm. it's far more practical. And because of that, it, it 
ultimately it leverages more punch and impact. So we're a membership organization and our membership represents a huge network of very significant players from multinational industry brands through to cultural organizations, through to small businesses, and then tiny sort of cultural organizations. So, and it's across all of the different creative industry subsectors. And I think that's what gives us that manda mandate and ultimately, you know, that goodwill around change. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. I think that's a great point about how the public should be at the core of any creative industry. Uh, Laura, before I ask you your question, and I know you're a big fan of Los Angeles, who's been to Los Angeles here before? Okay, so you have, you have a captive audience, uh, Laura. So Laura seems to believe that Los Angeles is the greatest uh, creative industry capital in the US. Is that roughly right? You, we, greater than New York? Well, <laughs> uh, one in six jobs in Los Angeles is connected to the creative okay. industries. Mm -hmm. And we have more people in every creative industry except writers than New York City. Oh, oh, oh okay. So That's just a fact. We're an art super city. So what you're saying is we need more writers to be based in Los Angeles. Yes, that's right. Oh, okay, great. So, so I want to ask you specifically about the Center for Business Management, which is um, you know, a center that you're affiliated with. What, can we, what does the center do and what can Los Angeles teach the world about creativity, diversity, and I'm afraid to use this word, inclusivity? What yes. can Los Angeles teach the rest of us? Well... First of all, Los Angeles was majority minority uh, before anybody else. We were majority minority back in the 1980s. So we've been dealing with complex issues around mm -hmm. diversity and inclusiveness for decades. Mm -hmm. um, the United States right now is majority minority for mm -hmm. everyone under the age of 18. As our younger people start to enter and get older into our society, they bring a cultural diversity with them. So for us in Los Angeles, this was an imperative. Uh, and when I headed the LA County um, Arts Commission, we launched a cultural equity and inclusion initiative, and we came up with 13 actionable recommendations, which to your very good points, were framed so that government could open the door to increased inclusivity and creativity, not walk through it, yeah. but enable other people to walk through it. And I just want to talk just very quickly yeah. about three of the ideas uh, that are so fundamental in rethinking how we do this. And it has to do with what Nora talked about in her opening speech around the democratization of culture. Mm -hmm. And that means decentralization. It means a willingness not to be top down. It means a willingness to recognize creativity where it exists already. And that means funding who is there and finding the ways to do it, whether or not they're organized as nonprofits or in a structure that we are familiar with. And for us, that was a recommendation to actually decentralize funding through our 81 municipalities in LA County, uh, enabling them to fund artists collectives, individual artists, and those not structured in more formal ways that, in ways in which we were used to funding. The second is to bring art to existing venues and where people are. And I know you're going to be talking about space, Paul, and can elaborate on this. But we have a vast network of parks and libraries. You do too. You have many other venues but we don't really integrate them into our thinking about the delivery system in concrete ways of funding those facilities to present artists and enabling them through professional development to do so. And the third that I'm just going to mention is funding arts organizations to market in not obvious ways. And by this I mean when there is a reliance on earned income, there is always going to be a tendency to market to those who are most inclined to come. And enabling organizations to flip that model and really radically rethink how they reach audiences that is not dependent on earning back the marketing dollars, I think is intrinsic to this effort. And there are many more, but I'll leave you with those three thoughts. 
Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, I see the UAE over the past few years, we've seen efforts to take art to where people are, the public, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, street art now that, uh, across all the, the emirates of the UAE. Uh, there are initiatives that mirror that, but I agree with you. We need to take the art and the creativity to where people are. I see you have your hand up. Would I you like to uh, I, chime I, in? I, I would like to make a, a, a plea. Um, I think there's a huge issue at the moment of artists not being paid for their work. So, you know, one of the building projects we're working on at the moment, the number of developers at Phonus Art. Who agrees? Who agrees here? Hands up. Who agrees? Well done. Yeah. The number of developers yeah. at Phonus Art and say, could, yeah. you, could you recommend an artist to paint this wall for free? They will get exposure. Mm. Artists are dying of exposure. <laughs> they are not being paid. Why is their livelihood, why is their labor not worth paying? Yeah. Uh, so to that developer who will remain nameless, we did say, will you build our development for us? You will get exposure to get your next contract. And so I do think that we need to take <laughs> artists' livelihood mm -hmm. seriously. We need to sort of really acknowledge the work, not just physical labor, but yeah. the intellectual labor, the emotional labor that goes into it, yeah. and we should pay them. So, so I think I love all, all of this, but I think this is where I think society comes in, is we should value the labor of the artist. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, I, I agree with you, and I think that we need to pay them fairly, to pay them, pay them fairly, and also protect the IP rights and protect their, of these yeah. artists. Yeah, so yeah. that's a wonderful point. And, and go I, ahead, Laura. I would just add, and pay appropriately the people who run arts organizations. Correct. Correct. Okay. By the way, Caroline, you're also welcome to chime in any minute now, so... <laughs> but, but I, <laughs> I, I want to I wanna ask uh, uh, Paul a question, but I, I Paul, so Paul is involved in this um, project uh, called uh, Making Space for Culture. And uh, so Paul believes that in order to have a thriving a, uh, creative sector, you need to have affordable, sustainable space. And I think he'll make a plea for it, but I want to ask you guys, who thinks here that we need more affordable space for creative sectors in the UAE? Yeah. Okay, I think so, yeah. Or any sector. So we, we, huh? <laughs> or any sector. Or any sector, any sector, but the creative sector more, more so. So, Paul, uh, t tell us why affordable space and sustainable space and flexible space is essential for a creative industry. Okay, um, so I just want to pick up on uh, that point about paying artists. So, I think uh, that the opposite of inclus inclusion or inclusive is not exclusive, it's extractive. Wow. Yeah? And I think one of the big challenges uh, in the cities that I work with uh, around space and around property market is you have these incredible sort of turbocharged property markets. You, you know, essentially, cities are, are kind of like magnets for capital investment, and it usually goes into bricks and mortar. Uh, and and when, when you uh, have a city like that, there is a massive, massive risk that you're going to basically get rid of the goose that lays the golden egg. And I, I think it's probably true in all of our cities. It varies in different degrees to what kind of level of development they have. And you do get cities that have a really, really deep, deep version of it with London and New York and LA less. But, um, and I, so I just think this issue about um, making sure that you have an ecosystem where there's lots of different types of, I'm talking physical space here, by the way. And I think physical space is gonna carry on being a hugely important core building block of any local or, or, uh, or regional um, creative economy. If you don't have that ecosystem, we've got different types of space that's um, accessible to different kinds of people on different levels and brings people together. And a key part of that is financial affordability. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so, 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 so I, I just think, you know, for policymakers, businesses, creators out there, they obviously agree. This has to be a sort of a, an article of faith. You know, you have to think of that as a key goal for all the work you're doing around policy um, and development. And the good news is, which I'm bringing to you here today, yeah? All Thank right? you so uh, much. Apart from making sure that everyone agrees that's a big issue, is that there's lots you can do about it. Okay. You, know, you know, sometimes I think this concept of, uh, you know, inclusion, inclusivity, it's quite an abstract concept. It's complex. You obviously, uh, creative economy is not I inherently inclusive. I mean, I think it's true what UNESCO says that it's open to more people because of the kinds of employment it can provide. And by the way, isn't that a staggering statistic we heard this morning? 20% of, of, of young people 
work in the creative economy around the world. That's an incredible statistic. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? Yeah? Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is something you can actually do something about. And if you look at our Making Space for Culture project, we've looked at this issue across 40 projects. Laura was uh, involved in instigating this project uh, when, when she was uh, working at, uh, for LA County. You can see that there's, there's a huge number of tools that you can draw on. Uh, these are enumerated in our study. First thing to take into consideration is that cities themselves, city governments, uh, public authorities, they own vast amounts of land and property. Uh, and they have jurisdiction over these legally in terms of management. There's a vast amount of things that they can do uh, with that. And what we find in most of our cities are doing, providing you know, special leases, sometimes kind of um, helping uh, artists to buy buildings. There's all kinds of really inter interesting things uh, going on there. And when they make that decision about devoting their property portfolio to arts and culture, that's not just an act of charity. That's not just pure, um, if you like, social value. That's also economic value. And there's some interesting studies in our cities. This, this is not particular. By the way, the evidence base for this is not huge. It's not, it's not very great. But where, where people have looked at this over time, you know, there is an, a, a, a very concrete economic return from uh, uh, using these spaces for artistic and cultural purposes that doesn't necessarily have a short-term uh, economic purpose. So you've got cities as property owners themselves. Cities also uh, have vast numbers of powers of regulation, of lawmaking, and, and almost every single city network has some kind of planning game system where you try to go from an extractive situation where the property developer or, 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 or the commercial interests use the attractiveness and the magic of culture and creativity to increase the value of their asset without then reinvesting in it. Yeah? And, but you can actually use the planning system. You, there are tools at our disposal. This is what we found in our work in, across the world, is that there are tools there that are often not being used. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, I think it's always really important in these discussions, and Pradeep can come back to this, it's really important not to talk about artists and creatives as sort of like the other over there who we do things for. You know, they have huge agency, and there's a really interesting, it's almost like a movement across the world of artistic and creative people taking their... Um, you know, their future in their own hands and becoming property owners, becoming property developers. There's a great organization in Toronto, my favorite arts organization, it's called Artscape. It's run by this brilliant guy called Tim Jones. You've got to get him over here to talk to you. Um, uh, and basically, they started off as, you know, a typical hippie-ish 1970s, you know, kind of art space provider. And now they're basically a property developer. They work with the big property developers in Toronto to develop spaces all over the city. So, I think that's the great news here, is that you can do stuff about it. Yeah? You can actually make your uh, city more inclusive for creativity. Yeah. You've, the tools are there. Thank you, Paul. It's such a profound statement that you said earlier, I'm think, still thinking about, about how the opposite of inclusivity is not exclusive, it's extractive. And I think this is something that we have to keep in mind. And I want to bring in Caroline here. Uh, to join us. Caroline, uh, you're welcome to comment on any of what was said earlier, but yes, I want to ask... I, go ahead. I, was, I just wanted to sort of um, actually to comment on, on what you've just been talking about because, I, you know, I, I, um, I vehemently agree with everything everybody said, but I actually think it's also there's, some, there's something that we haven't covered around, around inclusivity, which is far simpler, <clears throat> which is about investing in young people's education um, and investing in creativity and the arts and exposure to creativity and teaching young people creative skills um, at a very, very early age. You know, the Ken Robinson, I'm sure everybody's seen Ken Robinson's amazing TED talk where he talks about how basically creative, we you know we start creative and then it's beaten out of us. Um, and education does everything it possibly can in, the, in well, in my country anyway, to make you less creative. Um, and, um, you know, we see lots and lots of wonderful pictures of uh, politicians opening amazing art galleries. Um, but actually, you know, that's just that, that that's sort of when people have have managed to survive education and they've managed to survive um, an early career, not being able to get paid properly as an artist. Yeah. Um, and actually, that intervention needs to start right at the beginning, right at school. Yeah. The, the, the amazing, I think, the sort of the conundrum around the creative economy is that ideas are free. They're our greatest natural asset. 
Um, and it's quite easy, you know, to start out being an artist, um, working in the arts. It's much, much harder when it comes to making money. And part of the reason for that is because increasingly, the more senior you get, the more, the more sort of uh, exposure you get, the more networked you have to be, the more you have to be in the right rooms with the right people. And one of the keys to addressing that and to, and to, and that being, that does, you know, I agree with what Paul said around extractive value, but there is also something that, that is exclusive about many aspects of the arts. It is about being in this particular rooms with the right people and the right money around you. Um, but if you invest in the education of our young people, then, uh, it's easier for them to get into those networks. You know, it's easier for them to break down those barriers. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, we can tinker around the edges with all sorts of things like, you know, funding for, for, for creative um, occupations or space or policies or employment practices, et cetera, et cetera. But if we're not actually really investing in our young people, then we, you know, we're really sort of wasting that, that natural resource. Thank you, Caroline. That's uh, actually uh, so much of what you say is echoed in other people's comments. And I think the point you just made about the importance of investing in, uh, in uh, education uh, is exactly what I want to ask uh, Laura, because Laura, that was your role before your current job, is that you really lobbied to strengthen arts education in school. And I want to ask you, why is that so important? Why, why is it important to go to young students and, uh, and educate them about art and, and to instill it as part of the curriculum? Well, to Carolyn's point and to yours, um, if we live in a society where 20% of the jobs are going to be, the young people are going to be doing or in the creative industries, then not providing arts education to young people is a social justice issue. It's not a fairness issue. It's not just a um, economic issue. No. It's a social justice issue to provide those opportunities. Uh, we have a very complex educational system, maybe one of the most complex in the world, 81 school districts from large to small. And we managed to work with almost every single one of them to create policies and plans for arts education. Now, we still have a long way to go to see this implemented, but it can be done on a systemic level um, in terms of getting every school district to, to create a real policy and a plan. But we did more in terms of building on this, and this has to do with paying artists and having them in the right rooms. In Los Angeles, we created, in combination and partnership with the Getty Trust, the largest paid arts internship program for undergraduates that I think exists in the world. Wow. And I call that our secret sauce. We cannot expect young people to work for free for organizations and have an inclusive, creative, stimulating workforce because that system perpetuates a society in which only those well off can enter into the, our creative world. We fund with the Getty hundreds of undergraduates every summer to pay, we pay them to work in arts organizations for 10 weeks. And it, that program's been going on now for decades. And those kids are now our executive directors and they represent the diversity in Los Angeles. And they're not only running arts organizations, they're on the boards of arts organizations. Mm -hmm. They're donating to arts organizations. They're attending uh, and buying tickets to arts organizations. And they have become the hidden engine of an inclusive creative economy in Los Angeles. Wow, that's a great point. Um, I want to ask you, though, maybe before I move to Paul, uh, this is all thanks to a huge endowment and endowments is a feature of the, of the U.S., right? It's not available yeah. everywhere in the world. The Getty started the program, and they had a huge endowment. And their program cost them less than half a million dollars for, for this whole program. Wow. But it only funded interns in the visual arts. So when I was able to convince L.A. County, government agency, not a foundation, not a private endowment, to also invest a half a million dollars, in this program to, to mirror it for the performing arts and, and create 125 of these jobs each summer, mm -hmm. which is now, by the way, 
more than 250 jobs each summer. It was the easiest money I ever got because it was so clear to everyone that this was an investment in our future, in our economic future, and, what, and a key motor for our economic engine. So this wasn't just about private money. This was actually a public-private partnership. Okay. Um, Paul, would you like to uh, comment on that? I might regret going down this line of uh, inquiry. <laughs> but, so I, I've always been a bit uncomfortable with the concept of inclusion. Yeah, uh, it's not because I'm against including people. I think including people is very important, and I think it's 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 a brilliant idea. I'd, I'd like to think I sort of live my life by it. But I think there's a sort of suggestion in there, in all of this, that some it's, it's something a little bit paternalistic about it. Mm -hmm. You know, essentially we've got our thing over here, yeah, and what we're going to do is we're going to generously, uh, you know, push this button, give you that money, and sort of let you in. It's a bit like what Caroline was saying about you know mm -hmm. going into those exclusive rooms, and I I, I think diversity's a better concept. I mean, it's because almost like diversity is what you're trying to kind of achieve, isn't it? Inclusion is one of the ways in which you do it, but it's not the only way, you know? It might be that uh, you actually are going to increase uh, opportunities for and life chances and, you know, general well-being of society by all those young people in the future. It's going to be much more than 20%. It's going to be more like 33%. Not necessarily being included in the... Uh, failed business models of my generation, and let's face it, there are quite a few failed business models for the generation of those of us who are in our 50s and 60s. Uh, maybe there's a whole new set of things that uh, this new generation uh, and these new places around the world that have this kind of creative energy bubbling underneath them but aren't necessarily recognized as being creative, there's a whole bunch of things they're going to do that don't require any permission. They don't require you know, them to be let in. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I sort of feel sort of diversity and dynamism and understanding you've got to have inclusive institutions and regulations for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But the idea that somehow we're going to let all these people into this, some kind of existing fantastic party, which actually, by the way, isn't that fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think, I think we, that, that's, that, that's the way I think we should think about it. Well, I think, uh, go ahead. I, get, I always go back to words and what, what, how we take out the words. Um, and di diversity, uh, uh, of course, is something we, we, we all want. We want difference. We want, we want that difference because that is, even in our own personal relationships, it's difference that keeps you together. Otherwise, you're all going to be wearing matching jumpsuits and, you know, be, be in strange places. But um, it also comes with a double-edged sword. So none of these, th the, all of these words are both enabling and constraining at the same time. And I think that, that there is an issue for me in certain systems around access. Um, and certainly, uh, I, I think, you know, um, at Rhode Island School of Design, one of the most expensive art schools in the world. Rich people don't necessarily make the best art. And so how do you let access in for other people? So I think the diversity does become about how do you, how does a system exclude people? And we know that, the, you know, we talk about women in, in leadership roles, there is an exclusion. The system is biased against them as a lack of experience, which mm -hmm. is what your internships are trying to do. We're trying to the number of young people that come in for a job, they're perfectly capable, have no experience. How do we get them that experience? Mm. Someone has to break the system. So I do think this, this notion of diversity is, is, is really interesting, but we take it up in very weird ways. I think in the, in the work we're doing in the, in the foundation, arts we're taking in a very broad, broad way. And so really look, look at hybridity. We had um, the, the late Virgil Abloh come and visit us um, in the States. He got off the plane and he went straight into the studios and he was working with the students. He was late for his talk that we had lined up. Um, he then went off and he started cutting up bits of fabric. He then got stuck with the printmaking students in architecture and started doing work there. And then he did a music session. And so, you know, culture for me is what's happening around us. And there are some people that pick that up incredibly well and work in hybrid ways. And so this notion of diversity, I think, also applies in the arts because, you know, I, I know a lot of the artists that, that we're churning out of schools, even in the foundation, we run a emerging artist fellowship. They don't just paint. They also do many things. They play music. They've got architectural yeah. practices. And so that's the future is, is hybridity, and it requires a variety of imagination. So, you know, try, trying to create a space that is about the artistic imagination, but also the scientific imagination. 
but also in that, and I think this is something where, where the Sheikh Salama Foundation we've been sort of working hard, is the moral imagination. Because I do think that we need to give people the skills to think out loud, to think differently, which is, you can't think differently in the same space. Mm -hmm. um, but you also need the moral imagination and the courage to do it. And I think that's one of the things that if you've got a tension between diversity and conformity, because you know, we see this in our recruitment, we want to we want to recruit people that fit in our culture. Mm -hmm. So where does diversity sit in that? Mm -hmm. So there's contradictions in all of mm -hmm. these. But I think trying to create that conscious conversation, that conversation, I think, that is what is interesting. That mm -hmm. is what starts bringing in people saying, well, what do you mean? Um, and it, it, even, you know, we had the conversation earlier about LA is the most creative city <laughs> versus London. Um, the music scene in, in England has always fascinated me. Abu Dhabi's just got the UNESCO status of City of Music. Uh -huh. And when I think of music in, in the UK and you think of Liverpool, you think of Manchester, you think of London, they all have their unique sounds. It's still music, but they have their unique sounds. But they come together when you talk about Britpop. And so there's something about how do we celebrate that individualism as a collective. And I think that's the hope for us. You know, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, very different Emirates. Ajman is doing different things. But there's something that unites us in this sort of imagination space that I think is that, that's what brings the diversity together. Thank you, Dr. Paddy, for bringing it back to the UAE. And I know that you're doing wonderful <laughs> work uh, at the Sheikh Salam uh, Hamdan Foundation. And Caroline, I see you nodding uh, when, uh, when Dr. Pradeep was talking about the courage to think differently and how important yeah. diversity of ideas is in order to propel us forward. I, I'd like to ask you to comment, if you, if you would like, about what he was saying. I mean, I think that... Um Diversity, it's like, it's, like the, it's like a fruit salad, isn't it? You need the sharpness of an apple and the softness of a... Of a and, and, the, and, and what you're looking for is you're looking for more people who have um, a diversity of thought, who have a different experience, who have a different take on peach. You know, you don't want the same thing. You, and, and, the, and, and what you're looking for is you're looking for more people who have um, a diversity to um, ensure that you provide a way in for people from all different sorts of backgrounds and experiences and skills. And I think some of the most exciting things that are happening are in this hybrid space. Mm -hmm. And that's both between you know, different art forms where you see more and more collaboration and more and more convergence, but also between the arts and sciences. If you look at some of the most amazing designers, I'm just thinking about somebody like like somebody like Catherine Hamner, who is a very, very established designer, but for the last 20, maybe 30 years, she's also been working on new materials. You know, she's been collaborating with scientists to look at how, I mean, she was sort of green before it was a thing. She's looking at how do you create fabrics that don't need cleaning, but yet are, you know, are not harmful to the environment. Uh, I think that, I think this area of bringing together creative people and artists, people who've got that sort of artistic training um, together with scientists, that for me feels like a, it's going to be a really, really positive contribution to the world. And I feel, I feel that, you know, although my job is to, to expound the value of the creative industries and to make the case for the creative economy, um, really what I'm trying to do ultimately is to kill all of those definitions because what I want to do is to mainstream it because I fundamentally believe mm -hmm. that, as I said earlier, ideas are our cheapest, greatest asset. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do wow. is to create an environment whereby we can, un un you know, we can harness that, we can unleash that. Um, and that's what will ultimately make, make the world a, a better place. I, I feel that, that so many of the business models that we have in the creative industries are increasingly becoming the business model for so many other industries. Ideas um, are our... Sorry, sorry. Could, you, could you say it again? Ideas are our cheapest, most They're valuable. our cheapest, yeah, our greatest asset. Okay. So, so maybe th I'll, use, I'll use this point, Caroline, to, to move us towards the last uh, part of this uh, panel. Um, I think I'll begin with you, Laura. So ideas to set, up us, to set us up for the future. Where should the investments in the future creative industries come from? Who should invest in any sectors can you, can you tell us a little bit, uh, uh, can you share some of your Los Angeles uh, wisdom with us? Well, <laughs> and, and everyone else has their own wisdom. 
um, as, as well. I mean, this kind of relates back to our first question, but I, I wanted to also use this time to build on what you were saying, Carolyn, because um, we can't have arts and culture over here in a silo talking to itself. It has to be integrated and part of our strategy for every aspect of our society. Uh, and as part of this work, cross-sector work, we've begun funding non-arts organizations who utilize the arts as part of their strategy to advance their missions. Uh, we've started to place creative strategists in every county department uh, in order to help people rethink uh, how to deliver services in, in the best possible way. Um, but I also just want to make a point here about gender. Women comprise the majority of people who actually work to provide arts and culture in most of our societies, uh, certainly at the lowest levels. As you get up to the highest levels, they become fewer, but they are starting to obtain those positions. Mm -hmm. But in no way, shape, or form are we as women who are running arts and culture organizations empowering women artists mm. to the degree that we need to. Okay. Yeah. And we need to break our thinking that has been molded by centuries of uh, a, a man-specific um, artistic identity. We are in a position and a growing position of power and ability to be able to invite ourselves in. Yeah. So I agree with you. We should not be sitting here waiting for someone saying, largesse, yeah. we're going to invite others in. We have to invite ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And we have to encourage all of those representing diverse cultural traditions to do the same. Okay, amen. So if I can just finish by saying, <laughs> in terms of inviting in, so I think uh, we're on the, at the dawn, post-COVID, we've had a bit of a reset, not as much as we thought we were going to, but I think we're at, uh, at the dawn of a sort of a new, genera a new creative age, if you like, where I think that the notion of creativity and the understanding of its value is going to be spread even further. The answer to your question about investment is that, you know, investment will follow value as long as the value is understood and the people who are creating the value are good at you know, you know, kind of presenting that to the investors. That's the, the logic of it, I think. But I think that, that we're gonna be looking at you know, many, many, many more creative cities, for example. So at the moment, you know, UNESCO Creative Cities, I think it's got something like 220 cities. You know, but there are 500 cities in the world of a population of over a million people. There are 500 significant large cities. Yeah. I'm actually working on a project about this. It's called Culture 500. If you're interested in finding out more about it, paul at bop.co.uk. <laughs> um, uh, that's my next project. And I think that's the next horizon. It's yeah. not just about inclusivity in terms of what we talked about today. It's also about inclusivity and I think the, um, um, you know, uh, that was mentioned this morning, inclusivity globally as well, and those interconnections uh, globally. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Dr. Pradeep, uh, looking towards the future, what would you, uh, what would you uh, see that the UAE perhaps should uh, uh, invest in in order to uh, uh, expand the creative industry? I, you know, once again, it comes back to mental models. My mental model as an educator is obviously Invest in your people. It's, uh, kind of ideas are cheap. Good ideas are slightly less cheap. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I, I think you know, ideas are easy. Good ideas are much harder. But you know, the real challenge is how you put those ideas into action. And so you know, how do we invest in that? Because I think we can have ideas in here, but the real challenge is how do we actually take them out there? And so I think education is, is obviously one, one place where I think talent. You, c you don't build any creative industry without creative people. So start with creative people and build that talent and then provide, provide that pipeline. I think there's also something around um, just the notion of sort of celebrating that as well, because I think creators are notoriously territorial. You know, we talk about creators thinking outside the box. Quite often, they're in the box. Mm -hmm. You know, they've made the box around them. And so, you know, how do we create these spaces for, for, for territorials? And I think it's was saying, you know, not wanting to contradict. And I think there is contradictions in all of this. 
people don't travel to cities to look at accounting offices. <laughs> But they do go to look at art. They do go to look at culture. And so I, th I think to celebrate those and elevate those, but also not ghettoize them, not make them look like sort of a Walt Disney, here's, here's, a, here's an artist working. But to generally celebrate real art happening is that, I mean, I'd certainly love to see more, more talent supported in, in the UAE. And certainly that, that's the, the role of the foundation. So that's my bias. Um, but see that talent and, and just keep that talent growing. I also think it's not necessarily about youth. You know, there, there's, I have a small hypothesis in the UAE that there are a lot of 50 plus somethings here, um, as well as trailing spouses, mm -hmm. uh, sitting on a phenomenal amount of talent and creative juices that really could be unleashed. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Caroline, maybe in half a minute, if you'd like to add anything. Well, I completely agree. It is about investing in talent. Um, <clears throat> um, and it's also invest it's about investing in failure actually oh, it's wow. giving people the ability to do something and fail spectacularly at it yeah. but to give them a you know but to give them that opportunity i'm i'm less optimistic than paul is actually about the way things are returning mm -hmm. back to normal um and i think if you look at investment we you know we, we always talk about the greatest investors you know investing in risk well no they don't actually not in the mm -hmm. arts they don't mm -hmm. they tend to to invest in things that they can see they know about that they already know what the return is going to be and that's why i think it's really 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 important to invest in that in that intangible talent mm -hmm. and giving people the ability to actually muck it up a little bit yeah. um yeah. but stick with it and 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 um and as pradeep has just said you know to then go on and make it better improve that's mm -hmm. what we need to see Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank, Thank you, Paul. You. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you all for joining us.